We've been uh, talking about the, this basic piece of data that's collected in uh, seismic surveys referred to as a shot record. The shot record is a time distance plot. Uh, we've got the source located at x equals zero. And then we have a series of uh, geophones which are deployed out along the surface. And in this uh, time distance record, we see different events. We see, we talked about the uh, direct arrival. This is a, a path along which the mechanical disturbance propagates directly from the source to receiver. In our simple model, we have uh, constant velocities in two layers, uh, the near surface layer and an underlying layer. And so the direct arrival um, travel time, uh, the time it takes to get out to a particular distance x is just going to be equal to that distance divided by the velocity in that upper medium. So it has a slope then which is equal to 1 over the velocity. The relationship for the direct arrival was just t equal x over v, so it had a zero intercept. We also talked about the reflection event, and I would go back to the preceding video to look at that in more detail, but it's a, uh, a hyperbole, it has a hyperbolic shape. The direct arrival is, uh, serves as an asymptote for the reflection event, which converges on the direct arrival at long offsets. Now what we're going to talk about today is the critical refraction, and notice um, that it is also linear, and you might guess that just as with the direct arrival, which has a slope of 1 over the velocity in the upper medium, that this linear feature, the critical refraction, may have a slope which is equal to the reciprocal of the velocity in the uh, underlying medium, or medium 2. Notice also that we have to go out a certain minimum distance from the source before we ever see a critical refraction. And so we'll, we'll talk about this as we, uh, as we go along. <clears throat> In order to develop this relationship, um, we have to go back to Snell's Law. And uh, all I've done in here is just reproduce the relationship that you're probably familiar with from optics. And we just have the indices of refraction here, N1 and N2. And then we have the angle of incidence in medium 1 and the angle of, its, angle of refraction in medium 2. And the index of refraction is just equal to the or just equal to the ratio of the velocity of light in a vacuum to the velocity of light in whatever medium uh, is under investigation. Now we don't have a comparable velocity in seismic, uh, so we'll just cancel these out. Notice that we can divide both sides of this equation by c so that we get sine theta 1 over v1 is equal to sine theta 2 over v2. And this would be the form of Snell's law that you would encounter most frequently in uh, an acoustic uh, application. So with these, with the velocity of light canceling out and this being our basic relationship here, uh, in this diagram down here, we can see the incident ray, the refracted ray. We note that the refracted ray, in this case, is bent further from the normal. Uh, angle theta 2 is greater than theta 1. And this is in the case where v2 is greater than v1. So we have a, a larger velocity in the underlying medium, v2 being greater than uh, v1. So theta 2, then, is greater than theta 1. I have a lot of redundancy in these slides, and hopefully, it's, uh, hopefully it helps consolidate ideas rather than confuse you. But, but uh, So we have this uh, incident angle, and as this incident angle gets larger and larger, theta 2 converges on the interface between the two media. In other words, theta 2 becomes approximately equal to pi over 2. Again, we're looking at the case where v2 is greater than v1. We have this. We've just multiplied both sides of the Snell's Law relationship that we just looked at by v1, so that we get v1 over v2 times sine of theta 2 at theta 2 equal to pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. Theta 1 is equal to an angle we call the critical angle. 
So at the critical angle, uh, theta 2 is equal to pi over 2. Sine of theta 2 is equal to 1. So we have uh, sine of theta critical is equal to v1 over v2 times the sine of pi over 2, which is equal to 1, so that the sine of theta critical, now we're referring to this angle now as the critical angle, is equal to v1 over v2. Fairly simple relationship. The uh, sine of the refraction angle drops out. Now in this diagram, what we want to note is the paths along which the critical refraction travels. And notice that we notice that we have a path that goes down through layer one, and a path that comes up through layer one. Both of these paths, uh, the seismic disturbance must be traveling with a velocity v1. And then out along the interface here, we have the critically refracted ray, which is traveling with the velocity v2. Now, we have receivers deployed all the way out along the surface here. However many that might be depends on the nature of your survey. But I've only shown a few of them. The idea here is that the downward going ray uh, makes an angle with the normal to the interface equal to the critical angle. And as this critical refraction moves out along the interface between these two medium, it creates a disturbance in medium one. Uh, which produces ray paths which rise back up to the surface at the critical angle. Now we could show this with a Huygens wavelet uh, construction, that uh, uh, just a, drawing a tangent to all the little spherical sources as this disturbance as, as this wave propagates out along the surface, they would, uh, the tangent would have a line which would be normal to these ray paths, uh, which would give us ray paths coming up to the surface on a wave front uh, traveling up towards the surface with ray paths equal to at an angle equal to theta critical. So we have um, as you can see we have these these different paths uh, traveling with different velocities. The critical refraction with a velocity v2, uh, the down and up um, uh, portions of the ray path of the critical refraction traveling with uh, velocity v1. So what's the total distance uh, traveled involves determining what these distances are and what this dis distance is. So you can see from this diagram, this is a, there's a lot in this diagram here, but you can see that we're labeling the, we're referring to these as the slant paths. These would be the paths in medium one. They're traveling downward uh, a distance L to the interface before we get a critical refraction. And then they also travel upward uh, towards the receiver. That's that same distance, same distance L. So we have this uh, distance down, this distance up, which is equal to the total slant path distance, which would be equal to 2L. And the total slant path time then would be 2L divided by the velocity at which the event is traveling in layer 1. So we have 2L over V1. And then we have this path along the interface. Now the path along the interface is um, something less than X. And we note here that the we don't begin to get the critical refraction until we are at a distance L sine theta critical from the source. Then the wave begins to refract critically and we get these events coming up as the critical refraction speeds out along this interface. Uh, these events come back to the surface um, at, the angle, at the critical angle. This distance then would be equal to the total source receiver distance x minus 2L times the sine of theta critical. Okay, again, two distances, uh, 
two velocities. Um, I did note that there's some redundancy here, but let's take a look at this diagram and look at some other features in the diagram here. For example, this slab path length, L, we could also write that as H over the cosine of theta critical, H being the thickness of the layer. So L would be equal to H over the cosine of theta critical, and the total slant path distance then would be equal to um, 2H over the cosine of theta critical. And notice that this minimum distance out to a point where the critical fraction, refraction begins, we wrote it as L sine of theta critical, but we could also write it as H times the tangent of theta critical. And you might ask why. Well, we might have information about the thickness of the layer, uh, but we might not know what L is. And so this may be more useful, more useful uh, representation to us. So we can represent the total slant path time as the total slant path length, which would be equal to 2 times h over the cosine of theta, divided by the travel velocity. That would be v1. So we have 2h over v1 times the cosine of theta critical, being the time spent along the slant paths. And then we have the travel time along the interface, which, you know, as we show, this would be uh, x minus 2L sine theta critical, or we're going to be using h times the tangent of theta critical, so we have 2H tangent of theta critical. So the total distance along the interface is x minus 2H tangent of theta critical, and the total time, travel time along the interface is x minus 2H tangent of theta critical over V2. So that gives us the total travel time then of the slant path time plus the time along the interface. So we're just adding these two together. We have 2h over v1 cosine of theta critical plus x minus 2h tangent of theta critical over v2. Well, this is the question, isn't it? How does the critical refraction appear in the shot record? And what is its relationship to the reflection event. Well, we have this uh, formula. We've figured out what the relationship of the travel time versus distance uh, is in terms of the thickness of the layer, the two velocities, v1 and v2, and the critical angle. But what we need to do now in order to to explore this relationship a little bit further is to simplify it, and we do that by using this relationship, uh, kind of coming back to this basic relationship for the critical angle, that the sine of theta critical is equal to v1 over v2. And so this is a challenge for you um, to tackle before the next, uh, next presentation, is determine the travel time as a function of h, v1, and v2. In other words, eliminate the tangent of theta critical and the cosine of theta critical. And a hint, uh, a way that you might go about this is to recognize that uh, this relationship here tells us something about, it gives us information about a triangle that we can use in order to write different trigonometric relationships. So we know that the sine of theta critical is equal to V1 over V2, uh, the sine opposite over the hypotenuse. So the cosine of theta critical would be equal to the side adjacent over the hypotenuse. What would the side adjacent be in terms of E1 and V2? So that's the hint. And also while you're rearranging and reformulating this expression up here uh, so that we eliminate uh, tangent of theta critical, which, you know, why would we know tangent of theta critical in advance unless we knew what V1 and V2 were and so on? Um, also determine the minimum distance 
at which the critical refraction emerges as a separate event. Now, we noted that the distance out to a point where the critical refraction begins, we could write that as h times the tangent of theta critical. So this distance then is, well, think about that. And uh, that should wrap it up for now. I appreciate your uh, tuning in and um, hope you'll join us next time. Thank you.